on. Take your Bible, turn with me to the book of Hosea, and that is the Old Testament book right after uh, the book of Daniel. There you go, okay. Hosea chapter, well, we're going to be studying primarily chapter 1. I wanted to do a quick review uh, with you and then dive in. This may be the last message, I'm not sure, from the book of Hosea. There is chapter 13 and 14, and, well, 12, but we're looking at Hosea chapter 11. I heard from someone uh, that has been watching online, and uh, they wrote to me and said, I love the book of Hosea, and uh, I do as well. I've never preached it before, and I don't know if any of you have ever heard Hosea preached before, but we're going to go through Hosea chapter 11 today, and we're going to read, uh, really go through the whole passage here. It goes down uh, to verse 12, and I'm going to invite you, if you have your Bible, and uh, Keith, can you uh, find the scriptures there to uh, bring us up? I know you need about three hands up there right now, and I apologize. But Hosea 11, let's stand and let's read God's Word together. And we're going to read down through, um, well, let's read through verse 7, and then we'll be covering the whole passage. Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, let's read out loud. Let's read. When Israel was a child, then I loved him, and I called my son out of Egypt. As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Balaam and burned incense to graven images. I taught Ephraim also to go, and taken them by their arms, but they knew not that I healed them. I drew them with the cords of man, with bands of love, and I was to them as they that take off the yoke on their jaws, and I laid meat unto them." He shall not return into the land of Egypt, but the Assyrians shall be his king, because they refuse to return. And the sword shall abide on his cities, and shall consume his branches and devour them, because of their own counsels. And my people are bent to backsliding from me, though they call them to the Most High, none at all would exalt him. Let's pray. Uh, Father, I pray that you'll open our eyes, open our hearts to the truth, how we thank you for a passage that gives us insight into your love. What a wonderful thing it is to be able to preach this morning on God's unfailing love. Lord, bless now. Be honored in the time, not only in what we hear, but how we respond to it. May we not just be hearers of the word, but Lord, may we be doers, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. I failed to mention to the Straits, it's joy to have you down visiting, and I know you came down to be here to love your family, and so I'm glad that you're here with us. Let me walk you through an introduction. I hope you have the page there that is the outline, and uh, as you read Hosea chapter 11, I hope that you didn't find yourself going cross-eyed, because there's a lot of things when you read it, it's not immediately known exactly what is being said here. And I pray that this morning as we go through this passage that your eyes are going to be open and you're going to be encouraged because Hosea chapter 11 really is about God's unfailing love. And so let's take our Bible. You have your, your outline there. Let me give you a little bit of an introduction. This is just kind of going back as a review. Now a reminder, Hosea was the first of the minor prophets. Okay, And so as we open our Bible, we're looking at a man who is preaching in Israel. His book is relatively short. If you compare it to Jeremiah and you compare it to Isaiah, compare it to Ezekiel, wow, those are long books. Hosea chapter 11, though, is uh, brief. In fact, most of the chapters here might be 15 verses, 14 verses, 11 verses. So it's a very brief study that we have. Now, a little bit about Hosea. His ministry was in Israel, and I've, I've taken you through as a reminder. At this point in time, there are two nations that are taking up the boundaries of ancient Israel. The first is Israel herself, and that would be the northern ten tribes. And then the other is Judah, which is in the south. Judah is where you're going to find Jerusalem. Judah is where you're going to find the temple in Jerusalem. And so that's the setting. Hosea 
Isaiah is not looking so much at Judah. He is focused on the northern ten tribes. Those tribes that rebelled against the Lord early on. In fact, after uh, Solomon's death, the kingdom was divided. A man named Jeroboam took the northern ten tribes. He set up a calf, and that calf became the point of worship in Israel herself. Judah remained faithful for the most part through this historic time. Now, the message, what is he doing? He's calling a nation to repent. It would be, if he were living in our day, you could imagine what his message to America would be. It would be dealing with our sins and dealing with our idols, our, our, our possessions and the things that take hold on our heart. That would be his message for us today. But I wanted to draw your attention, you have your Bible there, Hosea chapter 7 and verse 1. The storms are hovering over Judah, or Israel. Assyria has pressed in, and the failing and failure of that nation, they are soon to reap it. And in spite of the idolatry, in spite of the sexual immorality of the nation, in spite of the fact that they have rebelled against God's law and commandments, God still says in Hosea chapter 7 and verse 1, He says this, I would have healed Israel. Isn't that a wonderful thought? What is the heart of God when we sin? You know what it is? I would heal you. I would love you. I would bring you back to myself. And what was needed was for the people to repent. Let me give you another thought, and it's here on this PowerPoint. Like a father longs for a prodigal son. Now remember that because that's going to be the setting that we're going to look at. Like a father longs for a prodigal son to come home, the Lord longed for Israel to turn back to him. God's love was re rewarded with unfaithfulness. God's justice and holiness demanded to be punished. I'll give you an illustration as a father, well, as a son, you can remember perhaps the words of your father like I can remember the words of my father. And you've done something wrong. Somebody said last week about being paddled or disciplined. And I said, my dad's listening all live. I would generally get at least two a day, you know. One in the morning, one in the evening. If I, if I got in trouble anywhere else, I was going to get a licking. Now, I, I realize you might look at me and say, wow, that's what's wrong with him, you know? But honestly, I look back now and I think, wow, my dad loved me enough to discipline me. But the word sometimes of the father to the son is, now son, this is going to hurt me, what? More than it's going to hurt you. And if you're on the receiving end of that discipline, it's now, yeah, yeah, right, right. But you know, as you get older, you know the heart of a mother and a father. And when you have to discipline that child that you love so earnestly, it does hurt more, doesn't it? You know why? Because it's a hurt that strikes to the soul. It's a hurt that you, you don't just forget about it. It resonates within let me take you through this thought here, and then we'll go to the Scriptures. Here's another. Like a father loves a wayward son, God loved Israel. Now that's the setting. God is not speaking to Israel as His bride, as the church. God is speaking to Israel in our passage today as a father would speak with a son. You get, have your Bible? One other passage before Hosea 11. Take, take your Bible. Look with me at Hosea chapter 8 and look at verse 1. Now God has pronounced his sentence against the nation. He is going to give the word that what you have sown, now you will reap 
as a nation. In fact, Galatians 6, 7, and 8, you're going to find that that passage of Scripture actually has its roots in what we're going to study today. Reaping and sowing. It's the law of life. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. You plant a seed of corn, and what are you going to get? Corn. You plant a bean, and what are you going to get? A bean. You, you plant a seed from China, and you don't know what you're going to get. Right? I mean, did you hear about that, right? Seeds from China, and they're showing up, and, and the health department is all over. So don't plant the seed. Don't plant the seed. But let's be honest. We're kind of curious, right? We know if we plant the seed, something's going to grow. The question is, what is it? Let me say this spiritually. When you plant a seed, be it the seed of sin or the seed of righteousness, it will bear fruit. What kind of fruit are you bearing right now in your life? Look at, look at this passage. Look with me at Hosea chapter 8 and verse 1. And God is painting a picture now of a coming of an eagle. And you think, what in the world does that have to do with anything? Let's look at it. You have your Bible, Hosea chapter 8 and verse 1. And Hosea is told by the Lord, set the trumpet to thy mouth. What is the trumpet for? The trumpet is an instrument of war. It is an instrument that rallies the troop. It's an instrument of praise in the temple. But in this setting here, it is a, a clarion warning of war that is on the horizon. Hosea 8 and verse 1, set the trumpet to thy mouth. And then these words, he shall come as an eagle against the house of of the Lord. The house of the Lord would be the house of Israel, because they, Israel, have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. So here's the thought. Assyria used, and in fact, go back to the earlier slide, if you would, Keith, for a moment. Assyria used the image of a man with an eagle's head and wings. That was the symbol of Assyria. In fact, this this uh, idol here, if you would, was what you would see. If you had entered ancient Assyria, you would have seen this symbol all over the city. When you went into the palace, you would have seen it there. When you went to, to uh, the places of idol worship, into their temples, you would have seen this symbol. And so when God is having Hosea put the trumpet to your mouth and announce that the eagle is on its way, it was literally and figuratively a picture of of Assyria. Assyria is coming. There is war that is on the horizon. And then look at verse 1 again. You're in Hosea chapter 8 and verse 1. Why is there war? Why are these enemies coming? And the answer is found in verse 1 of Hosea 8 again. They, Israel, have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. Sheila's going to be teaching in her class about the covenants of ancient Israel that you find in the Old Testament there. And one of the things that you see over and over again is that God's basis of judgment is His covenant, His law, and His commandments. And therefore, Israel, you have transgressed, you have broken, and the eagle is coming. What was God doing? God was saying, I'm going to use Assyria. And Assyria is going to destroy your cities. Assyria is going to be my instrument of punishing you, my people. Now look at the response. I didn't want to pass this up. Hosea 8 and verse 2. Notice the hypocritical response of Israel. Now I, Hosea is preaching. The eagle is coming. You have broken and transgressed my law and my commandments. And then the response of the people is this. Israel shall cry unto me, my God, we know thee. What a hypocritical response. They had turned away from God. They had been worshiping a calf. They had broken the law and the commandments. They had broken covenant with God. And so they pretend to be God's people, but they reject His covenant. They protest, we know thee, but they had, had spurned his word. They worship the calf as though it were God. Everything that you watch about Israel was a rebellion against God. And God hears them say, but we 
know you. But the answer to that is no. Because you have rejected me. And then finally, 7 and 8 also, uh, Hosea 8 and 7 and 8, Israel was doomed and the fate of the nation was decided. Let me give you a little bit of the meaning that you find here. Look at verse 7, Hosea 8. For they, speaking of Israel, have sown the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. You hear that sometimes, right? Sometimes in, in our society, you'll, you'll hear someone say, well, they've sown to the wind, and now they're going to reap the whirlwind. Here's the question. When you sow something to the wind, what have you sown? And the answer is nothing. Nothing. How do you sow wind? You don't sow wind. But God says this, you've turned your back from me, and now I'm going to send a whirlwind. A whirlwind would be, we would identify as a tornado, a path of destruction. I've watched over the years the tornadoes going across at least the, the, the Mid-South area through Alabama and on further out, Arkansas and all those, and even up north. And the path of destruction is unbelievable, isn't it? I remember as a kid... Uh, where a tornado had gone through, and we were seeing a, a piece of hay from a field. And that hay was stabbed into a tree. An amazing sight. How do you do that? A force that is beyond what you and I can comprehend. God said this to Israel. You've been wasting your opportunities, your times. You've turned your back on my covenant. And now you're going to reap. The consequences. I invite you to look at a few more. And this is on the PowerPoint. You don't have to turn to all these. But concerning God's case against Israel. We read in, in verse uh, 14 of chapter 8. Israel hath forgotten his creator, his maker. Hosea chapter 9 and verse 1. Rejoice not, O Israel, for joy as other people. For thou hast gone a whoring from thy God. Hosea 10 and verse 1, Israel is an empty, fruitless vine. Verse 2, Israel heart is divided. They're worshiping uh, idols and pursuing sin. Hosea chapter 10 and verse 13, ye have plowed wickedness, ye have reaped iniquity. Now that's the bad news. Hosea chapter 11, go there. And let me give you the good news. Is it cooling off in here, I hope? It's not too cool up here, but I'm hoping it's cooling off out there. Hosea chapter 11. Let me fill in your outline. Here it is. God's love for sinners is like a righteous father's love for a wayward son. God's love for sinners is like a righteous father's love for a wayward son. Just some thoughts. In spite of Israel's sins, God's love and compassion for his people, listen, had never failed. Israel had rejected God's covenant, disobeyed his law and commandments, but God's love never failed. Look with me. Hosea chapter 11. And let me walk you through this. Here's the first thought on your outline. The first thing I want you to see is that God's love for Israel was, first of all, a tender love. A tender love. Now, as we read this, we're in a way, we're kind of moving away from Israel, and we're looking at the application to us. Okay? So here you are. Look at verse 1 and 2. Hosea 11, verse 1. Hosea is to preach... When Israel, the nation, the people, was a child, then I loved him. And I called my son out of Egypt. As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed it to Balaam, and they burned incense to graven images. You have two thoughts there. Here's the first one in verse 1. That God's love is like a father's compassionate love. Look at verse 1 again. When Israel was a child, then I loved him. Now, Israel as a nation, 
We know that Israel began as the 12 sons of Jacob, right? Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. And of his 12 sons, there would end up being 12 tribes. God had given to Abraham his covenant that he would, as a believer, a man of faith in God, that God would show him the grace and make of Abraham a great nation, that his seed after him would become a great nation, and that through, through Abraham's seed, all of the nations of the earth would be blessed. That was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so God, as he's given this word for Hosea to preach, and he says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. Wonderful thing about children. They do have a little bit of a sinful nature. We all know that, right? But at the same time, there's a, an innocence that they have. One of the things I, I love about our Christian school here and our teachers, all the, the preschool and the kids coming up, we do everything we can to ensure the innocence of a child. You go to some other settings of school and education, and they're doing everything they can to tear down a child's innocence. But we want to do everything we can to preserve that innocence. And so here is what we're finding here in verse 1. When you were a child... When you were innocent, when you were tender, I loved you. I, I think of the, the, the passage of Scripture, you know, where uh, Jacob's uh, sons uh, hated Joseph. Remember that? And they, they sell Joseph as a slave to Midianites. The Midianites take him down. They sell him in Egypt. And we find this wonderful son, this great man of God that we follow through the Scriptures here, Joseph. And we find that God had providentially put him exactly where God wanted him. For what? To preserve his people. Let me give you the verse here. It's uh, Genesis 50, verse 19 and 20. Joseph said to his brothers who were scared, they're frightened. Jacob is dead. Israel is dead. And now it's Joseph. And they think like a man. And a man is going to get vengeance. A man's going to have his opportunity. And a man is going to have his pound of flesh. But that wasn't Joseph. Joseph was just the opposite of that. As his brothers are trembling and they're afraid that with dad dead, that now Joseph is going to unload all of the wrong that they've done him. But instead, he says this, when you sold me as a slave, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. What a wonderful thought that is. God's loving compassion. Let me ask you this morning. Do you know the love of God? And do you know that it is a tender love? Then look at another. The last part of verse 1. Let's go back again. I know I need to pick up my tempo here a little bit. But look at Hosea 11 and verse 1. And look at the last part of that. When Israel was a child, then I loved him. And I called my son out of Egypt. Remember, we're talking about the nation of Israel. When did God call Israel out of Egypt? Do you know when? Moses comes back, right? And he says, thus saith the Lord, let my people go. And so God says this, I have loved you from the very beginning. I loved you from the point that I chose Abraham to be my godly seed. I loved you when you were in Egypt, and I loved you when I brought you out of Egypt. The idea of Israel being God's son. Let me give you some verses, and you can follow it if you would. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 22, and I believe these are on the PowerPoint. Exodus 4 verse 22, and thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son. Verse 23, let my son go that he may serve me. That's where this idea, Israel was my son. Another, Exodus 19 and verse 5, here's God's covenant. And so God brings Israel out of Egypt, 
They have crossed the Red Sea. They have journeyed in the wilderness three days, and they arrive at a place called Mount Sinai. On Mount Sinai, Moses is called to go up the mount. There God gives him the Ten Commandments, and then God gives him the law. Moses brings that covenant back down to Israel. Israel and her elders, they listen to the covenant. Here we read in verse 7 and 8, Moses called, came and he called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words, the law and the commandments, which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together, all the people answered together, and they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. There's the covenant. And so here, just like a marriage covenant, husband and wife, I do, I do, and, and we'll never undo, right? Till death do us part. That was God's covenant with Israel. Here is my covenant. Here are, here are my laws, here are my commandments, and I promise you, Israel, I'll give you all the blessings. I will bless you with the land. I will, I will have the fruit of your fields overrun with my blessings, but reject my law and break my covenant, and I will judge you. And so that's God's covenant. They put it before the people, and the people said, we accept it. We are married to the Lord. And that's where you and I should be as believers today. Now let me walk you through verse 2 again. In verse 2, Hosea 11 and verse 2, notice that Israel broke God's covenant. And they became a rebellious, ungrateful son. We're still keeping that idea of father and son. Here, again, I want you to grasp the covenant here. God has said, here is my law, my commandments, here are my promises. And all the people said, I do. Now the basis of God judging Israel now in Hosea chapter 11 is that they have rejected and broken covenant with God. God hasn't left his people. God loves his people. His love has never failed. His love is the love of a tender father for a son. What had Israel done? The last part of verse 2, they had sacrificed unto idols, unto Balaam. Now, that brings me to the second one. On your outline, God's love is tender. Secondly, notice that God's love is gentle. It's kind and it's considerate. We live in a day today where love in our society is a portrait more of lust and taking than it is of giving. The same thing I sad to say, I think is part of the marriage culture, if there is a marriage anymore in our culture. Not that understanding of the sacrifice and giving and loving and giving of one another to the other, we become a very selfish, self-centered society that demands to be pleased. But that's not the character of God's love. Look with me. You have your Bible there. Hosea 11 and verse 3. And I want to walk you through this. It, we read then of God's tenderly guiding Israel. Let's read it. You follow. Hosea 11 and verse 3. The Lord says to Israel, I taught Ephraim. Now, who is Ephraim? Ephraim is the major tribe of Israel. And so often God addresses Ephraim on behalf of all Israel. So let's read Hosea 11 and verse 3. I guided, I taught Ephraim also to go. And I love this. Taken them by their arms... But they knew not that I healed them. That's the picture that you have here. God says this to Israel. When you were young, I took you by the arm. Can you remember those of you who are parents or grandparents? Do you remember when your kids were learning to walk? And, and you held them between your legs and you were letting them kind of waddle along. And encouraging them. That's the portrait. God said, Ephraim, speaking of Israel, I was with you. I held your arms. I was there to guide you. But notice again, but they knew not that I had healed them. You know, I cannot remember my mom and dad holding my arms and helping me walk. Can't remember it. And you can't either. 
We were learning to walk, but I don't have a memory of it. But I'm sure that it happened. And that is what God is saying to Ephraim. I taught you to walk. I held you by your arm. But I love, let's go on to the next one. Look at verse 4. With bands of love. Let me read it. Uh, Hosea 11 and verse 4. I drew thee with the cords or the bands of a man. With the bands of love, I was to them as they that take off the yoke on their jaws, and I laid meat unto them. Now, you can go cross-side on that. Let me walk you through it. When a beast of burden, an ox, uh, a horse, a mule, a donkey, when they have been trained, and they are submissive to their masters, when the master has a loving relationship with his beast, and the beast has a loving, dependent relationship on the master, the beast, we're going to say, let's use the horse. The horse in love will follow the guidance of its master. Instead of being dependent upon the bit in the mouth, it is more dependent upon the desire and the will of the master or of the rider. So the picture that is given here in this passage, God says instead of me wanting to drive you using a bit, a yoke, and a chain, instead of, instead of my, my being the oppressive master, I wanted to lead you with cords of love. I grew up with a couple of horses I was blessed to have. And I, re I remember putting the bit in the horse's mouth, and she's pushing it out and pushing it out. And uh, she doesn't want it there, but she's going to have to have it there. But you know, over time, that horse got such that I could jump up on her back and just hold on to her mane. She was submissive. Now, go back and, with that in mind and look at verse 4. God says, my love is gentle and kind and considerate. And I drew Israel with the cords and the bands of a man with bands of love. I've given you the story, and hopefully my dad won't get upset with me, of him trying to use our horse to plow the field. Now, she was a riding horse. She was not broken. And I remember my dad behind our horse, and he's got the plow in the ground, the chains going from uh, the harness that's up there, and they're going back. And she, if she didn't want to pull, she wouldn't pull. And if she wanted to run with him running behind the plow, she would run with him pulling the plow. You know, it, 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 was, it was a sight I can remember watching. And I, I feel bad, but I didn't feel bad for my dad. I felt bad for my horse, you know. It's, all this excitement is going on out there. That is what God doesn't want to do. God doesn't want to use the chains. He wants us to be guided by his love. Now look with me thirdly. Let, uh, keep going in this passage here. Uh, God's love is not only gentle, kind, and considerate. God's love is tender. But notice in verses 5 and 7 that God's love is patient. Look with me. Hosea 11 and verse 5. Now speaking of Israel. And we read, He, Israel, shall not return into the land of Egypt, but the Assyrians shall be his king because they refuse to return. Now, what does that mean? It means this. For Israel, Egypt had been a place of bondage. It had been a place of enslavement. Now, I don't know if you know some of the passage of Scripture where God was going to judge Israel in the wilderness. Israel is murmuring. Israel is rebelling. Israel is complaining. And, and, and God would say... I'm going to strike Israel, Moses. I'll raise up to you your own seed. And, and God would say to, and Moses would say, but Lord, what will the nations think? What will the heathen think? Lord, if, if you turn on your people, what will that say about you? I love that because Moses was concerned about God's testimony as much as he was concerned about Israel and her obedience. Look with me then at verse, uh, verse 5. 
Israel shall not return into the land of Egypt. Why? Because God was not going to put his people back into a land that would bring shame upon him and his testimony as the Lord's people. And so Moses goes on and he says there then, the Assyrian, that nation that is growing in power, that will be the nation that I will use. Why would God bring an enemy on his people? Look at verse, uh, verse 5. The Assyrians shall be his king because they refuse to what? Return refuse to repent. Why did God destroy Israel? Why did God destroy the capital of Israel, which was Samaria? And the answer is this, because God loved them too much to allow them to keep going down the path of wickedness and idolatry. He loved them enough to bring upon them a punishment that would ultimately turn their hearts back to the Lord. You know, God allows that in our life. He allows things that pull on our hearts and they bring a tenderness. God's judgment continues. Look with me, a latter part of verse 6. And the sword shall abide on his city, speaking of Israel, and shall consume his branches. The word branch there is a bar or his strength. And devour them because of their own counsels. In other words, Israel has rejected my word. Israel has rejected my law. Israel has rejected my commandments. And therefore, I am going to move with destruction upon the city and upon the land. The latter part, Israel followed their own counsel. They turned away from the Lord. Here's a question for you. Where do you get your counsel? Where do you get your direction? When you're making decisions in life, what's guiding you? Where does the world go for guidance? Psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, follow your heart. You know, we've got all these different expressions, and I'm afraid so often it's in the church. How many of us weigh our emotions and our decisions And we balance it or look through the filter of God's Word. Am I thinking right? Is my heart right? Am I thinking spiritually? Is it God leading me or is it the influence of other people that's shaping my heart and my emotions? Israel, look again, had turned to her own counsel. Now that brings me to verse 7. Like a rebellious son, Israel disdained God and rejected his prophets. We read in Hosea 11 and verse 7, My people are bent to backsliding from me. Though they, the prophets, call them to the Most High, none at all would exalt him. In other words, it was lost. The priest had turned from God. The false prophets had turned from God. The kings of Samaria were all wicked kings. And God says here in verse 7, that's where they're bent. And there is really the bent to backslide, there's no stop in them. They are going for destruction. And then fourthly on your outline, God's love is tender. God's love is gentle and kind and considerate. God's love is patient. Here's the fourth one. God's love is a faithful, forgiving love. You want to know the love that a father and a mother should have for their children? Or you want to know the love that children should have for their father and their mother? It's shaped in God's portrait. God is faithful and forgiving. Let me give you some meanings of this here. You have your Bible? Hosea 11 and verse 8. Notice this, that God's love endures. He never stops loving. Hosea 11 and verse 8. The Lord asks really four questions in this verse 8 here. Now realize we've laid the, the, the portrait of wickedness and sin Rebellion, idolatry, immorality, breaking of the law and the commandments. All of these things that are are the life of Israel. And now God asks four questions. 
What are the four questions? Look at verse 1. The first one in, or verse 8 rather. The first one is that God's love endures. He never stops loving. Let's read. You follow. Hosea 11 and verse 8. God asked in a tender tone, How shall I give thee up? Ephraim, the major tribe in Israel. How, how shall I deliver thee, Israel? Wow. You see the tenderness? With all that you've done and as much as you've hurt me, how can I give you up? How, how, how can I be anything less than tender? You've broken my covenant. You have broken my laws and my commandments. But I still love you. And I wonder, how can I give you up, Ephraim? Notice secondly on your outline, not only is God's love an enduring love, He never stops loving, but would you notice also that God's love is long-suffering. He longs for reconciliation. Hosea 11 and verse 8. We continue in that same verse now. Now the Lord's asking the third question. How shall I make thee as Adma? So who is Adma? How, how shall I set thee as Zebian? Who is Zebian? And the Lord says, My heart is turned within me. My repentings are kindled together. Now you've got to do a word search. I've already done it for you. But notice, if you would, Adma and Zebian. What are those? Those are two other cities that were destroyed with Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember, Sodom and Gomorrah was in a plain. The outlying cities were also destroyed because they were a part of the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, so God asked this again, Hosea 11 and verse 8, How can I give you up, Ephraim? And how shall I deliver thee, Israel? It's almost in the sense of God's desperation. What can I do? I've done everything. I've given you the law. I've given you the commandments. I've given you my promises. What can I do? And then he goes on with that same thought. How shall I make thee as Anma? And how, how shall I set thee as Zebian? In other words, those cities deserve to be destroyed. But how can I do that to Ephraim and Israel? You see, they deserve to be destroyed too because their sins are greater even than the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. You said, how is that, preacher? Because they know the truth and they know God and they rejected Him. Sodom and Gomorrah and all their wickedness and sin and their immorality, they didn't know the Lord. They were not His chosen people. But here we have Israel and Ephraim and they know the Lord and they've rejected Him. Deuteronomy uh, 29 and verse 23, I won't take time uh, to go through it, but this is the passage of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zebian, which the Lord overthrew in His anger and in His wrath. And so what is God doing? He is angry with Israel, and He is angry with Ephraim. And, he, and yet, in the midst of that anger, He's asking, what can I do with you? In other words, God had not forgot His covenant. The latter part there, the, in verse 8, My heart is turned within me. My repentings are kindled together. Here's what God is saying. I remember what I did to Adma and Zebian. I remember what I did to Sodom and Gomorrah. But what am I going to do with you? And God says, My heart has changed. I destroyed those wicked cities, but I've got a different heart for you. Because I love you and I have chosen you. In fact, my repentings are kindled together. So what is repentings? Repenting is compassion. And so God says, my heart is changed. I destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and Adam and Zebian. I destroyed them, but I've got a different heart about you. In fact, I'm repenting. In other words, I want to show compassion. Now, look again. I'm going to give you some thoughts about God's love. So God's love endures. It never stops loving. 
God's love is long-suffering. He longs for reconciliation. Here's the third one and found in verse 9. God's love restrains His anger. You know, sometimes you hear on the news, you read in the newspaper, and you'll read about uh, maybe a father who took a gun and he slaughtered his family. Or you'll read about a son who in his anger took a gun and he killed his family. We, we read all of this violence that is such a part of our culture. You know why? Because we live in an unloving culture. We are an ungodly culture. But the question is this, do we who claim to know the love of God, are we a loving people? Are we tender? Are we, are we gentle, kind, and considerate? Are we patient? Are we faithful? And are we forgiving? Look at verse 9. Verse 9, I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man. What's God saying? I'm not man. Man will want the pound of flesh. Man's going to want his vengeance. Man's going to want his way. Man doesn't care who he's going to hurt in the path of getting his revenge. But God says here, but I'm not man. I am God. Look again. 11 to verse 9. And so the Lord's love restrains his anger. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. You deserve it, Israel. But there's a difference in how I'm going to treat you and how I treated the wicked. And that difference is my love. Let's go on. Look at the fourth one here. God's love restrains his anger. Notice also that God's love is immutable. It is not fickle. It's not given to change. uh, Hosea 11 again in verse 9. God says, I am God. And not man. You remember years ago, people were wearing uh, bracelets, and it was WWJD. Do you remember that? What what did it mean? What would Jesus do? And I wonder how many that wore that were sincerely wondering what would Jesus do. God says, "I am God, and I am not like man." I will not enter into the city. What does that mean? I am not going to enter into the city with wrath. I I am not going to send the angel of death and utterly decimate my people. Are people going to die? Absolutely. Because God's judgment is coming. But God's heart is not to utterly destroy His people. It is to restore his people. Let me give you a verse, and we're almost done. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. And so we need to leave here today. I'm going to give you number five. We need to leave here knowing who our God is. But also knowing we're supposed to be like him. In our character. So who is our God? Let's review. God, His love is tender. His love is gentle, kind and considerate. He would take the arms of a child and lovingly teach him to walk. You see the tenderness there. God is faithful and forgiving. God's love is patient. Number five. God's love is a restoring love. Think about the prodigal son of that whole story. The boy is off. He's taken his inheritance. He's wasted it on riotous living. He comes to the end of himself. And he looks up to heaven. And he says, I'll go home to my father. And I'll say, I have sinned against heaven. And I have sinned against you. As he is Nearing home, I've often pictured in my mind the father was looking every day for that son to come home. He sees off in the distance a ragged, dirty, broken man. It hardly looks like a son, but the father receives him with the tenderness of 
of a tender father and a restoring love. Look with me, you have your out, uh, scriptures there in your outline. Hosea 11 and verse 10. God promised the day would come when he would remember Israel. And like a roaring lion, Israel would be freed to tremble. What does that mean? You follow as I break this down and we close. Hosea 11 and verse 10. They, Israel, shall walk after the Lord. That is, depart with the Lord. The Lord shall roar like a lion. And when he shall roar, then the children shall tremble from the west. The word tremble, it can be to be afraid, but it also means to hasten or eagerly journey. Do it in an application. You are, let's say you're at church, and you look off across the lobby, and you see one of your kids misbehaving. I'm going to just use Eric's name so I don't get in trouble with anybody else. And so you look off in the distance, and there is little Eric running around with little Mark. And Paul or Sherry will say, Eric! Now, there's a sense of tremble right there. But there is an eagerness to get over where mom and dad are. You see that? The idea of trembling is an idea of hastening. You know, uh, uh, a, a child, and I, I can think with, with our granddaughter a little bit, you know, something, something happens, something shakes her, and, and it's tremble, tremble, tremble. But they're in the process of trembling. They're running when they're little to the security of mom and dad's love and care. With that illustration, let's go back. Israel, in verse 10, shall walk after the Lord. And the Lord will roar like a lion. And when he shall roar, the children of Israel shall tremble and hasten from the west. In other words, they're going to begin their journey back to the land. Verse 11, they shall tremble as a bird out of Egypt and as a dove out of the land of Assyria. And the Lord promises, and I close with this and then some closing thoughts here, and I will place them in their houses, said the Lord. I don't have time today, but if we had time, we could go to Isaiah 11. And in Isaiah 11, you'll see the Lord returning. And the majesty of Jesus Christ as He comes again as the Messiah, the King, the Judge of the earth. And Israel, God's people, will be assembled there. And you and I who know the Lord, what a wonderful day that's going to be. But let me close. I need to wrap up this compelling love. And I'm just going to wrap it up with some thoughts. The first is this. God's love is a tender love for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. God's love is a gentle, kind, and a considerate love, like a shepherd who knows his sheep. God's love is patient. God's love is forgiving. And then I close with this difference here. God has said earlier, I am God, and I am not a man. Let me give you a closing portrait of God's anger versus man's anger. Here's God's anger. We find it in verse 8, uh, Hosea 11 and verse 8, and here it is. God's anger is disposed to reconciliation. God never gave up on loving Israel. They had committed all manner of wickedness, but God Never quit loving. Hosea 11 and verse 8. How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? My heart has changed within me. And my compassions or my re repentings are kindled together. And then finally, God's anger is disposed to reconciliation. But what about man's anger? Man's anger is disposed to Vengeance. 
I will not execute the fierceness of mine anger. And I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man. Let me close this morning. Do you know the love of God? It is tender. It is compassionate. It is kind. It is faithful. It is patient. And it longs to restore. Man wants vengeance. God wants reconciliation. When you think about your love for your children, your love for your family, your love for others, what is the character of your love? Is it the love of God? Let's pray. It's about an eyes closed. I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Armstrong, uh, the love of God. I'd like to close maybe with one verse of that. It's about an eyes closed. And I want to ask you this morning, do you know the Lord is your Savior? I've talked a lot about God's love and His compassion and His tenderness. Now I want to ask you, do you know the Lord? You can know Him through His sacrifice of Himself. He loved you so much that His love is demonstrated in the fact that Christ died for your sins. And I ask you this morning, if you don't know Him, would you right now with your head bowed and your eyes closed, would you say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. And Lord, I, I identify with Israel and her sins. And yet I realize today that you love me. You love me enough that Christ died for my sins. And Lord, today, I ask you, forgive me of my sins and save me. And Lord, I pray today also for our church family, and father and mother and sons and daughters, and those who are single and looking for love and others maybe who are in marriages that are struggling because there's a lack of love. Lord, I pray right now as we consider your love, we consider that's the kind of love I ought to have. I ought to be tender and compassionate and forgiving and faithful and patient. And, and Lord, I confess that my love is not some of those things. And so, Lord, I ask you as... I think about your love for Israel that I would consider my love for others. Lord, change our spirits that we're looking for reconciliation with people and not vengeance. We're looking for peace, not conflict. And so Lord, as we close with this verse about the love of God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts as we sing it. It's a wonderful song if we not only know it, but we live it. And so, Lord, bless right now. We pray as we give just this verse of invitation that some of us might need to bow the knee and say, Oh, God, I'm so far from your love today. Forgive me. I pray. Let's stand. Let's sing.